Alex here with a legal nuts and bolts video on affirmative defenses. When a person is taken to court and accused of having done things, the person who is accusing them has the burden of proving that those facts alleged are in fact true. There are, of course, odd situations where the accused can raise what they call affirmative defenses and prove things um, on their own that if true would negate or nullify whatever it is that they are alleged to have done even if it turns out to be true. Now we're going to obviously need some examples here because that was just a whole lot of gobbledygook. I'm sure people aren't going to fully understand what I just said. So one example, a person is accused of killing someone else. The government, obviously, I mean, we're looking at a criminal case. Well, not obviously. There are civil cases, too. Anyway, let's assume it's a criminal proceeding. The government has to prove that they killed that person. If the government succeeds, does that mean they're guilty of a crime? Well, not necessarily, because that defendant has an opportunity to raise affirmative defenses, and one of the most common affirmative defenses in that particular situation is self-defense. Now, if the defendant is able to prove that they were acting in self-defense, then it nullifies or negates criminal liability. It doesn't matter that they killed that person because they have proven an affirmative defense relative to that crime. So one of the things that might jump out at people is the burden of proof flipped. A lot of people think, hold on a second, isn't it supposed to be the government's job to prove something beyond a reasonable doubt? Well, yeah, they're supposed to prove the facts that they allege. But when a defendant raises affirmative defenses, they carry the burden of having to prove that particular affirmative defense. My understanding is that the burden of proof is different on affirmative defenses. I think it's preponderance of the evidence, but I'm not 100% sure on that, so I'm not going to really get into that. I may do separate videos on each of the different affirmative defenses and get more into that. Another um, example that is pretty common is in landlord-tenant cases. Somebody breaks a lease, moves out early. Landlord sues him in court, trying to recover the cost for all of the rent for the months that they um, did not live at that particular residence. And that sometimes could involve quite a large sum of money, especially if they got like a two year lease and they moved out after six months. You're looking at 18 months worth of rent there um, in damages. And they, it doesn't sound fair, it doesn't seem fair because it's like, wait a minute, can't the landlord just get somebody else to move in? Well, that actually is an affirmative defense and it's got a name. It is called, um, duty to mitigate damages. The landlord in this case, it, it, this kind of applies to any type of contract case, but in this case we're using landlord. The landlord has an obligation to mitigate the damages that they are going to suffer from a breach of that contract. And so if the defendant can show that that landlord did not try hard enough to get somebody into that place, they can reduce the amount of their liability. The court can say, yes, you broke the contract. Yes, it is proven and you are liable for this full amount, but you raised an affirmative defense, which you also proved. And this is going to reduce the amount that they can recover. It's, it, you could kind of think of them as excuses. I don't know if that word necessarily fits into every single affirmative defense, but in a way, it's kind of like you're saying, okay, yeah, that's true but I have an excuse. And if you can prove that excuse, then you can uh, negate or nullify uh, civil liability. In this particular case, it's civil. So I hope that people can kind of get their head around this. You've got one side that's accusing the other of having done things. The other side naturally gets to defend themselves, but they also can affirmatively bring up certain things that they want to prove that if true, nullify or negate civil and criminal liability that they're being subjected to. So uh, one more is contempt of court. This one comes up a lot in child custody cases. A lot of people wonder, hold on a second, don't you just have to prove they violated the court's order? Well, yeah, that's one part of it. But the person who has violated the court's order has an opportunity to show that it wasn't willful or that they had some kind of um, some kind of reason. I guess, I don't know if it's, that's really a fair way to characterize it. I know that there is uh, something known as necessity, which allows people to get out of um, criminal liability. I wonder if something like that would apply. I think it does apply to civil. So you could also show, well, if I didn't violate the court's order, more harm would have occurred. And that's just what the, it's the necessity defense. I'm not even sure if that's an affirmative defense now. I don't want to get on a tangent. I'm going to do separate videos on all this other stuff in the future. But anyway, it comes up a lot in child custody cases that 
somebody's violated a court's order. Well, let's use the example of um, child support. Super common. The uh, government, if they're the ones bringing that case, or the ex, if they're the ones having to br uh, bringing it, has to prove that, number one, they're entitled to child support. So they could do that by showing the court's order. And number two, that you didn't pay it. So they can just show that no monies were deposited. Boom. They have proven you know, what they needed to prove to get a contempt of court. However, the contendor, the other, the, the other side, the one that's being accused, can show a reason. They can show an affirmative defense as to why, you know, they didn't pay that, you know. And one of them is that it wasn't willful. They can say, hey, look, I got fired. I'm not making any money. I can't pay if I don't have the money to pay it. And that's it's a pretty common affirmative defense. And I think... Um, the I think I already glazed over this earlier, but one of the most important things to understand is that when you raise an affirmative defense, the burden is on you to prove that, and it's important not to just go in there. And let's use a child, contempt of court child support example. It's important for the the person who didn't pay to just go in there and think, hey, I can just claim that I didn't, you know, I, that I got fired, or I can just claim that I didn't have any money, and get out of this. Well, no, the burden of proof is on you to show <laughs> why you didn't pay. You're the one that is admitting you didn't pay, I, yes, I violated the court's order, yes, I'm supposed to pay, but I didn't. If you have an excuse as to why you didn't, the burden is on you to prove that. And I think sometimes people don't really fully get that. It's not always, uh, the burden of proof is not always on the person who is alleging or accusing the other side of having done something. When it comes to affirmative defenses, the burden of proof flips over to the defendant, the non-movement, the respondent, whatever they happen to be in that particular case. So I'm going to go ahead and end this video. If you have any questions, feel free to post them down in the comments below. And I'm going to think about doing a specific videos on the different types of affirmative defenses. And um, if, in the meantime, I'm, I'm going to go ahead and uh, see you guys next time.